Dang it, man. You know I didn't have one. You know I didn't have a graphic. Exactly. The two I showed you beforehand. You could have warned me. No, that's the whole point. I was saving this one the whole time. Uh, what is up, football fans? But most importantly, UFL fans, welcome to episode 10. 10. 10. The one we have hit double digits. Double digits, brother. And we are we are so excited, man. We got a good one today. We're not just gonna talk games. We're gonna have uh some fun segments. So I'm really excited to just shoot the crap with my main man Webb and our host KB. And let's roll the music, guys. Let's do it. What's up, brother? All right, special team, special plays, special players. Tuesday, Tuesday, we got a great episode, guys. Uh, first of all, we have to do the fan question. We've added it, and we've been getting some good answers on YouTube. It is a question we are specifically asking to the fans, and you guys answer in the comments. And then Webb and I, uh, starting last week, started answering ourselves. So this question, I think, is a very fun one. Uh, it's going to be, what... UFL player, do you think could be the next destroying? What football UFL player right now in the league do you think could go start making YouTube videos and be the next destroying? Web, I'm going to let you start. It, it was automatic for me. I think it's Jay Sternberger. Uh, he's wow. got that big personality. He's got that big personality. He kind of talks a little trash. I, I like those type of YouTubers that are kind of joking around, you know, like it's more talking head it's not destroying with the trick kicks and all that kind of stuff but i just feel like i would watch a show that's led by jay sternberger and his big personality and that that's why i wanted that vote i guess i'm kind of showing my age there like i'd rather hear people talk than seeing them do <laughs> doing like, stuff <laughs> yeah doing doing like a kick because i have an attempt to spend longer than two seconds so um I, I just feel like jace would be a great personality for the league um and I like those type of guys. So, and I can't believe I'm saying the stallions, but you're that was saying my, Jace, uh, not just stallions, but Jace yeah. Sternberger himself, uh, who was a big anti Maulers, big anti anti Ducky, anti Web. <laughs> and so I think it's funny that you're picking the old Sternberger. But yeah, I I'm going full personality, but I'm also going with what's hot right now. Um, and honestly, kind of destroying adjacent we got brad wing brother i you know quarterback Ooh. punter i think he's like australian he's the only guy in the league i know right now who has the visor dude come on special team special players this dude is fire man brad wing struck gold he came in uh he threw the touchdown to alex millette r.i.p to the king bet down on ir now and He's just got the testicular fortitude that it takes to be a good YouTuber in today's day and age. I think he's brash. He's funny. He's cunning. He's probably attractive. I don't know. And so I, I think he would be that kind of personality. He would need a producer. I don't know how creative he is specifically. I'll produce for you, Brad. Let's do it, man. But he went on the Pat McAfee show and basically just like stole the show from Pat. So I just I see him being a guy who could go on youtube and also he's m around the world this man's from like australia i think is yeah. his accent yeah and so yeah. he's pulling in also australian viewers you know destroying is pretty american because it is american football but if you got brad wing he probably plays some soccer he's a punter like come on man i think brad wing is the answer i think you're a little crazy to have put jace but I don't know. That's whatever. I digress. I digress. Tuesday, Tuesday. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> Let's go, man. Let's go. All right. So answer your question. Answer the fan question in the comments. Let us know which UFL player you think would be the next destroying. If they went and started a YouTube channel right now, which UFL player could be the next destroying? So that brings us to an actual segment that we have today. KB, what is the first thing that we're going to talk about? Let's just get into our game picks for the week. You heard the lady. Let's do it. Game picks, Web. Let's. You want to do them in yeah. order? Yeah. Uh, yeah but let's do them in order. First, I first want to. I first want to bring it back to week two because you know it was the uh, polar opposite mania game, and uh, 
looks like you finally lost one to me. It it only took three years. You're right. It only took three years, but it's two to one in the overtime series. I mean, in the series now with our teams that we cover. And uh, the champ is here, man. You the are champ right. Is here. What happened? Rowdy Audi got to you guys. Let's be honest. Uh, Rowdy Audi got to us. That's such a cool name, honestly. Uh, you won the poll. You won the game. You won the picks for last week's game. You really smoked me. I don't, I'm not sure what the standing is right now. I think we're probably close to tied. I know I was ahead, but you've really yeah. been getting me these past two weeks. So these are the polls. We only did them on Twitter. If you went and you voted on Twitter, then you're a part of this. But yeah, <laughs> Webb, you smoked me this week. That sucks. Uh, so I will be donating $100 to the Best Buddies Foundation of America, and I will post it online and post a link, and hopefully more people will donate as well with me. It's That's a fun way to lose. You know, it, you lose the game, and that stinks. It's not cool to lose. But when it means that you're going to do something to help people, I, I'll do that every day. I'll do that all day, every day. I'm not afraid of it. I so agree. I agree. It works. But good game, brother. That was a oh, good game, brother. That was a good one, man. That was... Uh, it was a nail biter to say I was stressed at the end of that game would be an understatement. Uh, that game was brutal. So many mistakes. How about you guys blocked our punt? You recovered it. We then forced a fumble. And instead of recovering it, Kiki Chisholm kicked it out of bounds, dude. Oh, I had a tough game. I, I was. Well, it, it starts with the block punt because the block uh... punt, they block it and like they pick it up and then like your guys just like kick you guys no. just try to get like instead so of jumping on the ball your guy picked it up and recovered it and then fumbled it so if we had picked it up it would have i mean I it was further back but it would have been a new set of downs for us but instead we kicked it out of bounds and the situational awareness yeah instead of jumping situational awareness was lacking on all levels but i digress i digress let's do it okay so <laughs> uh <laughs> Let's get into our game picks, man. So after last week, you are now five and three. I'm four and four. Uh, I think you, someone's feeding you the script, dude. That's not fair. Who knew? Who knew last week that the Roughnecks would you lose? You picked the Michigan Panthers. I did. Hey, like, let's I'm be a honest. homer, man, and that's my brother's team. But this week, I didn't pick the Michigan Panthers. Let's talk, was, let's talk about it. And I was it. two minutes away. I was two minutes away from going perfect last, last week. Let's be honest. Legit yeah, two minutes yeah. away. I, I really, um, at the beginning of that Brahma's game, the Brahma's showboats, I was like, dude, I might go own four. I was like, I might actually go own four. And then the Brahma's pulled it out for me. The uh, Battle Hawks pulled it out in what was a fantastic spring football game. That was one of the most fun spring football games I've watched in a long time. It was exciting. The crowd was great. The atmosphere, the, the uh, announcing and the presentation of the game was really good for the Renegades Battle Hawks. That was a good one, man. Uh, yeah. And Definitely. then we watched that piece of crap that was the Roughnecks versus the DC Defenders. It's just an ugly game all around, but with a fantastic catch. Riley Moore, great catch. Great catch, yep. man. Fantastic people, fantastic place. But that was a fun time. Let's move on to this week's games, though. So we picked the first day we picked the same. So let's just let's get into those games. So the first day we have the Renegades at the DC Defenders. This is your team. So I'll let you explain why we are picking the DC Defenders. Talking to a lot of players that uh, played on the team last year. This is a revenge game. This is a redemption game. Uh, this game means a lot to this team, even though it's only week three. It means a lot in the season, too, because you can put her to the Renegades at 0-3 and make it a race and stay with the Brahmas, who are 2-0 right now. So they need this is a must win because either the Brahmas or the Battle Hawks are going to win, right? So one team's either you're going to have a 3-0 team or you're going to have two 2-1 two teams, and you can't lose this game. This game means a lot. The, the most fascinating stat about this, and me and Alex talked about in D.C. Defenders, this is the best third-down conversion team on offense with Arlington. They're 12 of 22, while D.C. is the best third-down defense in the league. They're 4 of 21. Four, they've only given up four first downs on third down. And so that will be the key. Um, Sal Canella is going to be a problem for us. I really believe that. I don't. They have a ton of wide receivers, but I'm not too worried about them in South Canela because that middle of the field with, uh, with the middle of the field against that defense seems to always be open or underneath stuff. And I think Sal could be used there. Um, I'm not too worried about the receivers, but Luis Perez is still, you know, the OG, like just still slinging it. And then Lindsey Scott, 
Me and Alex talked about this on our show. We don't, we don't highlight every team, every player, but Lindsey Scott, I have a feeling they're going to have a series for Lindsey Scott this week because they're going to try to surprise Greg Williams. I could see that because Greg Williams, he's blitz happy. Like you said, when you're that blitz happy, you said that the middle is open a lot. That's because you usually will bring a lot of linebackers and it's hard to fill in that gap with the linebacker who's faking coverage, bringing the blitz. That's where you want to throw the ball, right? And it's usually over the middle of the field. And that's where Sal Canella is ah, chef's kiss. So I like that. I like the Renegades quick, receivers. While, while you talked about Sal Canella, Alex said that it sounds like something you eat when you have raw chicken. Sal Canella. Sal Canella. <laughs> Sal Canella. He, he, he just talked about it for like a good solid 10, ten minutes. So leave a comment. What is that? What is, is that? He... Stallions run? You're talking about random stuff for 10 minutes? <laughs> no, no. We were highlighting uh, Sal Canella, but it's, uh, it's what you get when you eat uh, uncooked chicken. Sal Canella. But go ahead. Sorry. Well, I think you hit it pretty easy. So I'll just uh, real quick say I think DC is the better team. I think that uh, the offensive line for the Renegades has not looked great. PETA eight against them when they played the Battle Hawks last week. Uh, I think you guys are just going to get in there and I don't know. Their receivers, I like their receivers. Uh, Winstead, Deontay Burnett, Tyler Vons. I think they're underperforming really bad this year. So I think you guys win this one flat out. And that's all I got to say about that. But let's go on to the next game that we agree on. And why do we agree on it, Webb? Because it's the Birmingham Stallions. And I don't think, I, I think the showboats, so I'll go first. I think the showboats yeah. have a really good defense. I don't think it's as good as everybody is trying to give them credit for. And I think that the Stallions just know these players. They know the showboats, whether it be Filippo, whether it be Todd Haley, they know this team and they've always had their goat. I don't see it happening. Uh, it's in protective. Man, the showboats couldn't even beat the Brahmas, who I don't think are as good as the the uh, Stallions. And that was a home game. This one, it's supposed to be a pretty good crowd in Birmingham. You know, Alex Magoo's in the house. I don't know, man. I don't know. I just don't see it happening. What about you? Yeah, I, I, I definitely don't see this happening. Um, I am going to say this is my blowout of the week. Woo! Um, th this is the game that I think can turn ugly because I think the Stallions are going to be... Birmingham fans are upset that they were the last team to be the home opener. They are yeah. upset about that. Like, I think they're going to come out rowdy. Um, they're not going to be Audi or, or St. Louis or San Antonio. They're going to be the, you know, the Alabama Birmingham rowdiness that they can get, but they have the best offense and they have two quarterbacks, right? They, they're still figuring out who their quarterback is. They've got two running backs. They've got a ton of receivers. Their defense is so underrated. And I think it's so good. No one talks about Birmingham being one of the better def defensive teams in the league, but they really are. I do. And yeah, we, we do. I think their secondary like, is scary. Well, like, the, uh, the only thing with their secondary, Gilbert and Ike Brown are both on the injury report this week. But here's the thing. Memphis doesn't scare me on the passing. Memphis does not scare me on offense. I know they got the chef, and I know uh, and we're going to draft quarterbacks later in the show, and it would probably be one of the top four quarterbacks. Taken. Who knows? I don't know where you have them on your draft board, but they their offense does not scare me at all. No, like it, it, it just doesn't. And the defense is solid enough, but like you get they get tired because they're on the field a lot. So I, well, I just they're on the field a lot because K Case Cook is on the ground a lot. That offensive line gives him no time. Their uh, the receivers' route trees are the the limbs are trimmed off, dude. They cannot do. Crazy routes. They can't let plays develop the way that John Filippo wants to do and stretch the field vertically because they can't protect Case Cookis. And then on the defensive side of the ball, when the Roughnecks couldn't get anything going, the only thing that they really could get going was when Jarrett Garantano moved out of the pocket. He ran twice. Uh, and then last week, the Brahmas, Chase Garbers, what really worked was when they ran the GTFO and Garbers moved out of the pocket and they just found openings. And who's Probably going to be one of the better teams to do that, to be able to have the quarterback move out of the pocket, find openings, run down the field. It's this team. Matt Corral is a great scrambling quarterback. He throws great on the run. And Adrian Martinez just runs well in general. So I think that they could get picked apart. I think if the quarterbacks start running, they're going to have to bring their defense up. And then Matt Corral has the arm to just throw it over their head. So I could see this being a blowout. I could totally see that. 
And I think it would be decent for the league. So I'd be okay with it, even if it means the Stallions win. And I picked them. So, nah. And Memphis fans, can we start showing up to games? For real. Like, you wanted a team and like you made a big deal. Like it just, it looked terrible on TV. They were, uh, they're all mad that the Titans yeah, ended I, up uh, in Nashville. And they're like, why did yeah. we get the Titans? Because you guys yeah. had what, less than 8,000 fans in the stands? Come on, man. Exactly. 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 So. <sighs> Come on. Come on, brother. It's not getting it done. <laughs> Let me tell but you. To go, uh, but, it's not getting it done. Birmingham, Birmingham averages 47 yards more than the next uh, best offense uh, yards per game. Like that, that is huge. That's a half a field. And the yeah. fact that they're able to do that in two games and some teams have put up some good offensive performances and they still are beating. Dude, the they're able the to averages. get the run going so much that after week yeah. one, they had four of the top eight rushers. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. Ricky Persons, man. I, he's yeah. been uh, the sleeper pick the bad, of the year. Bad man. That's a bad yeah. man, dude. Yeah. He's a good person to have on your team. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> ah, special teams, special players, special puns. All right. <clears throat> I'm killing myself here, dude. Okay. <laughs> now we move on to a game that I specifically care about because it's the brother brawl. We got the Houston Roughnecks versus the Michigan Panthers. I've just came up with brother brawl, brother brawl right now. But I am picking the Roughnecks, and I know that's tough. But one, I'm a homer. Two, I cover the team. And three, I have zero belief in the Michigan Panther offense. Uh, they only stuck in that game last week because Mark Gilbert, we found his one kryptonite. It's a really fast receiver. And Marcus Sims was able to get behind him and catch a ball and outrun him. That 76-yard pass was the difference between a blowout and a close game. And that was their only good play. Otherwise, they had little chunks here and there, but they weren't able to sustain a good drive. I think our defensive line is honestly still better and has more rotational value than the Birmingham Stallions line. I think we'll, our defense, defensive front seven will stay more fresh than Taco Charlton and company for the Stallions. And I think with Reed Sennett in now, the offense just looked to start clicking. He's hitting passes with accuracy. I think that the... I think they have a good secondary on the Panthers, but I think you can pick the zones apart. Uh, I really think you can. Keith Gibson had a great interception, but that was kind of a makeup play where he got a couple good passes against him where coverage broke. So I think we can do it. What about you? You picked the Panthers, I, I mean, you jerk. I, I did pick the Panthers because I think their defense is good. And I'm going to be honest with you, your defense did not impress me last week. I, I I believe your front seven. We were one of the worst offensive lines, and we actually performed better against you guys than San Antonio. Okay. okay. I I Ruben had a great first quarter, and then kind of I don't know, it was kind of there. It was and like I a good Ruben. first half, and then he really yeah. didn't pick up any stats in the second half. And then your secondary was able to be beat a few times. I I just I just feel Michigan's defense is very consistent. I know you say the secondary has problems. Um, but I think they've also faced two of the top offenses in the league and for them to be kind of maintain in the game and kind of be there. I, I think, I think they'll figure it out. Don't get and me wrong. I think they'll, I think this they'll, will be they'll a close sweep game. by like, like it'll be like 12, 10. Like I, I really game. feel it, it, it. I love it because it's actually going to be very good in the trenches. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a battle there. Um, I like both linebackers. You got two of the best linebackers in the league in Ginda who had 14 tackles, and then Ruben is just that guy. Ruben. Um, their secondary, I love their secondary, but I, I know I'm a little bit of homer there with the Maulers because they had Gibson and Torted in. Nakua, Nakua is like a linebacker, and that's that's going to be the key. If Reed Sinnott, when he comes up, because he loves to hit, if he comes up, you got to be able to take advantage. And that's where Keith is getting beat a lot because they're playing zone, and Nakua is coming up uh, for run, uh, play action. Nakua, you could see it. Nakua is coming out of position. That's why he's not great on high on PFF, even though he's putting up numbers. He's good on the he run defense on PFF. He's a, very a, a, good. A, a, very, his pass, very good. His pass defense is like middle, like almost in the fifties, and it's pulling his grade yep. real hard because he does come out of position, like you're saying. And and that kills. And it, when you play a lot of zone, that kills the corner, who, who is Keith Gibson. They play on the same side. Levante Taylor is a dog on that other side. We know that's that. a beast. We fought, yeah. And then they got torn in up top above him. And then you got Ginda and they got Pat Rush. I think it will be big for you guys to get a running game against this team. 
It's kind of like what I when said about the defenders last week. You need to. It's not even necessarily a running game. You just have to make the defense respect the running game. Yes, because you are running running the ball, and just like the defenders did against you guys last week, they averaged like three point two yards per carry, but they stuck with it. And I, and I think uh, I think Michigan figures it out. I'm curious to see if they have a short leash with EJ Perry because they did take him out. Edling comes and fumbles the ball, and then you don't see Edling for the rest of the game. That sucks, man. So, I really wish yeah. Edling hadn't fumbled because I think he could have come in and done something. That first play looked like he was about to light a fire. You know, he yeah. immediately came out. And Frank Ginda is very good, reigning defense player of the year. But if you go watch that game, the reason that they were able to keep drives alive a lot is because they would leave Ginda on a spy kind of, you know, man coverage with him in the middle running a zone, but keeping his eyes on the quarterback. And he kept getting drawn into the line. And then it would just leave these wide open lanes for Perry and that one play for Etling. And he really was doing an awful job of containing the quarterback. And so I thought about that. And I I specifically asked CJ today in the media call if Nolan Henderson was going to play a quarterback, because I think if we bring him in for a couple series, he could pick up a lot of yards on his with on the ground with his legs because of that. I think that they were bad at keeping contained last week. And if we can add a running element with the quarterback, then it'll help when Reed Sinnott comes back in and they have to respect the run just a little bit, but whatever. I, I, th- I think we'll Michigan's got to play up, up tempo. They got to, they got to play up tempo against you guys because that's, that's when the defenders were able to move the ball the most is keep, keep those big guys. Don't let your don't let them line be too deep. Don't let be them be too deep. Out. When you yeah. guys started running tempo, Dude, we yeah. had Olive Sagapolu and yeah. Toby Johnson Toby. in there for five yeah. plays in a row. And by the end, yeah. they're getting zero penetration because they're gassed. Yeah. Because they are supposed to be in on first, first and second down. And then on third and fourth down, Keontae Shad comes in and you bring in an extra end. So like Ethan Westbrook is coming in. And so, yeah, I think it was smart. You guys were wearing our big guys down and that's a genius play. I thought it was really smart. Yeah. I noticed. Yeah. I definitely noticed. But one more game to talk about. Uh, And I think this could be the game of the week. Uh, A lot of people are looking at it because some people are fighting to say that the Brahmas deserve to be number one in the league. And some people are fighting to say that the Battle Hawks deserve to be number one in the league. I'll let you go first. What do you think? San Antonio has definitely impressed me. Um, Their moxie and their testicular fortitude in the fourth quarter against the Memphis Showboats, uh, tip of the cap to them. But at the same time, their one mental breakdown against the defenders from possibly losing the defenders and their one stop away from losing. Good teams win those games, and I get that. But I think I think they're going to face the Bad Hawks, who are probably the best offense they're going to see in these first three weeks. It's better than DC and probably and better, definitely better than Memphis right yeah. now. I I think this defense is going to have a tough time with AJ McCarron. Um, I think I I. I just feel that the Brahmas can't keep pulling these rabbits out of the hat. And okay. And I'm, I, this is, it's definitely the game of the week and I'm going back and forth and I was texting Josh before the show and I was like, Hey, give me the injury report. Maybe I got an injury on there. And he's like, it's clean. Both teams were clean. And I was like, man, so I think so they just haven't reported the them yet. No, it, it, it actually like it came out with like no names on either of them. Yeah, that's because they don't have to report until today. If you're the Sunday game, because uh, the last two weeks, the Roughnecks, no, the last two weeks, the Roughnecks injury report would come out and it would have nothing until the Thursday report. So I think if you check today, it'll probably have something. Uh, Obviously, San Antonio's got some injuries with destroying and uh, Millette, but. um, But they're on IR, so they don't even show up on the report anymore. They literally don't even say it can't. I don't even say it can't. But M- I think Mollett that the problem is to, right. Mullet has to stay. Mullet's probably going to stay into camp, right? Because he, he's um, only got a five week. Maybe. I don't know. But they don't yeah. show up on the report once they're on the reserve. But yeah. we're getting away from the game. Let's talk about the game. I think the Brahmas are going to win. Why do I think the Brahmas are going to win? Because they do not give up. So last week when you saw them drive down, and you saw them win that game at the end of the game. Uh, they got down at one point to Memphis to where I sat there and I was kind of thinking to myself. Most teams in this league, I honestly, I think if the Roughnecks, if it had happened to the Roughnecks, probably they would have gotten down and given up at that point, right? Like once you get down far enough, they were down enough on the boats that everybody thought it was over. 
Like people were turning the TV off. My dad turned the TV off. My brother turned the TV off. I didn't turn it off because, well, I'll take in every second of football I can find. But a lot of people gave up and a lot of teams would give up. But the Brahmas refused to. They did not give up. They really showed that testicular fortitude. They showed their grit. They really did. They showed grit and they showed that they're not here to mess around. They're here to win games. And well, the last time the Battle Hawks had to show that was against, I think, the Panthers. I think the Panthers was the closest thing where the Panthers really were taking it to them on defense. Nothing would work. Uh, they lost. And then last week, it really felt like the Battle Hawks were more in control most of that game. And so I think that Garbers is hitting his stride. He threw almost 300 passing yards in the second half of that game last week. I think Garbers is getting in stride. They're finally getting Cody Latimer involved. I think AJ Smith, I know that a lot of people are saying he's not that great of a play caller, but I think he's finally feeling out his offense and he's seeing the strengths. I really do think that he's seeing what works and getting away from what doesn't. And I think this week, man, I think it could go either way. This is a 50 50 toss up for me right now, especially because it's in San Antonio. And I know that they're going to put up like a 14,000 uh, attendance game. And I think it could be a really good one. So I'm going to give it to the Brahmas because they're at home. Uh, so the over and under, I believe, is like 44. You think over or under? Over. I, I think neither defense is like that powerful. I don't think either defense is that crazy. I think it could go over pretty easily. Yeah, I, I This is like agree. the one game I think could. You know, it's two I, of the I take top the, three offense. Yeah. yeah, it's two of the top three offices in the league. So I take um, the under exciting. every time. Every time, brother. Yeah. Take the under. Good play. But uh, I think that that one could. So, brother. But that brings us to the end of the games. Let's do one last recap of our picks. Just show them real quick. Go back to the presentation. We agree on Saturday. We agree on both games. And then on Sunday, we disagree on both. So we could go two and two. We One of us could go four and oh. There's a lot of possibilities here. But Saturday, we are in full agreement, and it will not change who is in the lead. But whatever. Now, we are on to our next segment. KB, what do we got? Uh, Webb already mentioned it, but let's let's do a QB draft. All right, let's do a mid-season QB draft. Webb, what are the rules, sir? The rules are we're going to draft based off of uh, their performance and what we expect them to do going forward as well. Okay. Um, just these 10 games. Uh, and we're just going to do four and four. You don't have to draft every team. I know we like to sometimes throw extra rules and everything. You could take all three roughneck quarterbacks if you want, if you feel like losing. I this want draft. Benji Kahar. Benji. <laughs> but we will go back and forth. No snake draft. Um, since you lost. That is a the, snake. Uh, oh, no, it's not a snake draft. You're right. Yeah. And I'll since let. you lost the Polar Opposites Mania game, I'll let you go first. You let me go first? You earn, yeah, you earned the first pick by having the worst record. That's what's up. Okay. So yeah. I know that you have stats and stuff. Uh, I'm just free, free willying this right now. Uh, my I have paper, generic stats. It's nothing my, special. It's oh, nothing my paper special. just says Ace1234, Web1234. Um, so yeah, this is live. Fully doing it. Who am I going to take? Uh, you know what? I said it in a prior episode, and I'm going to say it right now. Who do you think I'm about to take? AJ McCarron. Matt Corral, baby. I think he has wow. by far the most upside. Um, I know a lot of people online are saying that they like they they like Adrian Martinez. They're saying they think he fits the uh, offense a little bit more. Some people are saying they still think Jamar Smith should be getting the nod because this offense would lean more to a game manager than an improvisational, you know, could get the home run hit. They think that you should be playing small ball with this offense because your defense is that good. I think Matt Corral is the best overall quarterback in this league. I think he has the best arm talent. I think he makes some mistakes, but I think he puts you in the best position to win the game. If you had a final drive and you say, hey, we're starting at the 25, you have two minutes, get a touchdown. Matt Corral is who I'm picking. You're not picking Chase Garbers, the guy that actually Who actually did, did that? that? No. Yeah. <laughs> the guy who literally did that? No, I'm taking the sexiest quarterback in the league, Matt Corral. Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Right. With My wife said Reed Sinet, but I'm saying Matt Corral. With the second pick... I am choosing. Ooh, I'd like. Honestly, I'm gonna. I'm gonna behind the curtain a little bit here. 
Matt Corral was fifth on my list. Whoa. Okay. Our draft because boards I, are I different. did a draft board. Yeah, and the yeah, fact yeah. that mine Very is different. I don't have yeah. one. So. I am going to go with AJ McCarron. As much as it pains me to say that, I think he's a very professional quarterback. I think he's the most NFL ready quarterback in the league right now that could play in the NFL. Um, he's got a lot of weapons, 65% this year, right? Um, you just drafted Matt Corral, who has a uh, completion percentage of 51.5, and it's not even the pure number one quarterback on his own team, but you I'll drafted him anyway. But AJ McCarron, I think he is a leader among men, and that's what you need on quarterbacks. And AJ is playing for his kids, man. He's playing so his kids, and as a dad, I I just love it. So I will say AJ McCarron, as much as it pains me to say it, because the Bad Hawks obviously are not my favorite team. All right, so you took AJ McCarron. Um, yeah, whatever, dude. Don't talk bad about my number one overall draft pick. Fifty one percent is that what you said? Fifty one percent completion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so 51% of the time, it works all the time. Special teams, special players. All right, so I'm going to get you, let's say, hmm, who do I want for my second pick? I'm going to take Chase Garbers. Let's go. Yes, because I am now taking the guy who actually was given the ball with two minutes left, and they said, hey, we need two scores. And he freaking did it, dude. And you know what else he did? He liked every post that I posted about him during that game. So, thanks, Chase. I appreciate you, buddy. Thanks, He's brother. Kid. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Love you. Uh, he really did. Did you see my post where I said, um, offensive coordinator losing his mind on Chase and it's Chase Garbers, and it's just a super awkward photo? Just Dude, the one where they <laughs> announced him as QB1, I think that's the most awkward photo ever. They had this one right here that I put where he's smiling and he looks happy, and they put the one where he looks super uncomfortable. He's just... And so I posted that, and Chase Chase liked it, and I think that's a blast. So Chase Garbers, number two, I'm well, killing you. Ch- Ch- Chase, is, Chase is definitely uh, killing you. He's got the best passing completion percentage, seventy three point eight percent, and like you said, almost had three hundred yards in one in half the last game. Yeah, and then four hundred forty three yards on the season. So championship. It's, uh, it, I I will be honest with you that that was my number three quarterback on the draft board, but you left my number one on the draft board. I know who it one. Is. I, I, I was, who's who's going to be? It's Jordan Thomas. No, it's not. It's Luis Perez, man. You want to talk about a receive a, a quarterback that's seventy percent passing, seventy percent passing, seventy percent, man. I wish my quarterback got sixty five percent on my team. I, you, as a Houston Roughnecks fan, <laughs> would love to have a quarterback complete sixty five percent. He's got seventy, man. And he's always in a passing situation. They're always they're in tight games most of the time, um, and we're or they're behind where they got to throw the ball a ton. Luis Perez is is my number one. He was my number one on the draft board. I only drafted McCarron so you couldn't get him um, because I thought that was where you're going. Uh, Luis Perez is definitely my, and I'm scared to death of this week because of Luis Perez and Sal Canelo's relationship. But um, that's my number two quarterback. So you're up. Man, every time they show Sal Canola on the TV, I point out to my wife, to Claire, I say, that guy has a clothing line. He's a really pretty guy. Because I'm just trying to get her engaged. I'm trying to get her to just like watch the watch the game. And I'm like, this is it. Clothing line. Like, look it up. Let's buy me a shirt. Like, you say I have the words. Stop wearing rough deck stuff. Buy me a shirt. Let's do it. But, <laughs> but my third overall pick, who I'm going to take, is my man, the chef. I think they're pushing that nickname too hard can i just get on a soapbox here for a second nobody <laughs> called him the chef no one called him that and then suddenly this espn pro uh like presentation they're like we call well, this man the, the chef over. yeah they're like the chef the is about to hit the over we call him the chef he's flipping pancakes and i'm like no one called him that nobody called this dude the chef why are we no he's case he's case cookies like we say the man can cook Whatever, but nobody called him the chef, and they're just pushing it down our throats. And I'm like, hey, shut up, man. It's not his name. His name's Case, and he's deserved. he deserves that respect. But I'm picking Case Cookus because Case is the best quarter. I think he's just so good, dude. I think the dude is getting killed every play, and he's still putting a lot of balls where they can be caught. I understand that he underthrew some balls this week. I think he's been getting killed. I think that's why I still think... 
you know, I watched him play live in USFL season one's championship. And I just think the dude is special. The way he can move in the pocket, he can make plays out of nothing. Case Cookus, my man, Captain Cookus, the chef. You're coming to our team, buddy. Third quarterback. Got him. Championship. That's all I need. All That's all right, I so, need. You're so done. You let, You're done, I, Skis. No. Jordan Tiamo. Come on, man. What is what are the my, my next pick is Jordan Tiamo. I figured. Uh, what is the what is the next what what is the style of offense right now that is all the rage in the NFL with a quarterback, a mobile quarterback that RPOs? can use the RPO. RPO. West Coast this is, is called this West is, Coast. This is no West Coast is the two step drops and get it out. This is RPO where you're going to run pass option, right? Yeah. There, there isn't a better player. There isn't a better player in the league right now. Quarterback that can run the RPO. And if and if they pick up the tempo, you saw it against Houston. I said it earlier in the show. He could be the he could be one of the best quarterbacks in the league, and he was the offensive player offensive of the year. Player of the year. I was about to say he was the XFL. He's proved it. But they they need that running game part. Abram Smith was obviously very good, and they got to fill that hole. But they he started to see some things that they were able to do RPO, and I think Jordan Thomas is about to take off. And if Here you look Higgins at his stats, good. yeah, Hag- Higgins, Cameron Harris is uh, pretty good. You, you got to remember, Cameron Harris was selling cars for two years. They called him off the street a year ago. So, like, he's still kind of getting into game shape, I would say. Um, Jordan Talmud is definitely my my next pick. And it leaves an interesting decision. I, I think these top six quarterbacks were almost, mm. o- almost, almost guaranteed to be the top six. This is where it gets we'll interesting. Who, yeah, th- th- this will make or break your team. It gets I'm interesting, but not that interesting. It's recent, baby. Good prestige, best players. Tuesday, Tuesday. Reed in it. Let's go. <laughs> so you said, you said that I would love if I had a quarterback who had 65% completion percentage. Okay, brother. Reed Sinnott has never ended a season with less than 66% completion percentage. He had 66% complete percent completion percentage in the game that he stepped in this week, and he went 19 for 30. 19 for 31? He is a baller. This dude is a gamer. He, for some reason, cannot win the position in camp. I don't understand why. He lost to Jack Cohn. Who loses to Jack Cohn? Bad players, bad teams, bad place. Jack Cohn. Tuesday, Tuesday. Sucks. <laughs> just, I'm throwing it at you until you laugh is what I'm doing, man. I'm just out here. Let's go. What's up, brother? <laughs> and just hoping you laugh because it's fun. I love making you laugh, man. But uh, Reed Sinnott, in all honesty, he's very accurate. I think he's an absolute gamer. When he came in, he immediately started picking apart the D.C. defense. Uh, He was seeing the blitzes. He was throwing at the blitz. He was hitting open people. He was going to win that game. If Kirk Merritt doesn't literally just fumble the game away, and if our offensive line doesn't kill 20 seconds by just false starting, like he was about to lead us to a win. I, that game was not Reed Sinnott's fault. It was not his fault that we lost that game. I think he's an absolute gamer. I think he's one of the better quarterbacks, and he's going to prove it. I really, I really think so. At the end of the season, if we go look at these quarterbacks on our draft boards, I think I win, dude. I think I win. I'm going I'm to I'm write it right here, real big. Sinnott. And then under it, I'm going to write champion. Sorry, it's take, taking me a second. What's the rest of that word? Is it? Is it? Oh, it's ship. It's championship. It's championship web. That's what I just drafted. Who's your last quarterback? As if it matters. Who'd you pick? Who'd you, you pick? don't even have a graphic for this guy. I've been saving this guy the whole time. You're gonna say Lindsay Brandon Scott Silver. Jr., Lindsay, bro. God dang it, man! Lindsay you know I didn't Scott. have one. You know I didn't I have a graphic. <laughs> exactly the two. I showed you beforehand. You could have warned me. <laughs> No, that's the whole point. I was saving this one the whole time. Um, Lindsey Scott Jr. is better than the quarterbacks, better than the quarterbacks in Houston. I would say he's better than the quarterbacks in Michigan. Oh, and I I think he his role is his role is going to expand um, throughout the rest of this year um, in Bob Stoops, uh, Chuck Long's offense. Um, I, I do you know who? Yamu's quarterback, I mean, offense coordinator was in St. Louis when he was with the Battlehawks in 2020. I have no idea. Chuck Long, the oh. same guy that's in Arlington. 
Oh. Lindsey Scott kind of fits that mold. He fits that mold. And, it, uh, and, and I just think that Lindsey Scott, his role will continue to uh, grow. Yeah. And I think Luis Perez works in a two quarterback system. We saw it in New Jersey with the USFL that he can come in and if he's just gunning it, that's fine. But Scott gives you that different dynamic where he can run a little bit. And as much as I wasn't a big fan in the preseason, the more I see of him, the more I'm like, oh, this guy could be pretty good. So I'm going to uh, go yeah. with Scott. No, I do like oh. him. Um, one of my problems with quarterbacks where everybody's like, he can really run, is that sure they can run, but once they run, they're eliminating the pass completely. Lindsey Scott, something that I do like is when he comes in, he will start running, but he does keep his eyes down the field. And so he has had a couple times where it looks like he's about to run and then he just suddenly stops and he launches it. Um, and I think that that's really impressive and it's good in a league like this. You need to be able to do that. That's something that Case Cookis does. And it's one of the reasons that I drafted him so high. It's one of the reasons that I love Case Cookis is that you never... The pass is never out, out of the option. It's never out of the equation. He can start running around. You're like, oh, Case is about to take off for four yards. And then suddenly he launches it like 60 yards. So, okay. I like Lindsey Scott. I still think it's so, crap that you didn't tell me before. I don't know if you can see this, Adam. but uh, okay. that's an L. That's an L for you. You can't see that. But You it, wrote an L an on L. your paper because you took the L, brother. No, if it... it if you're able to see this, I don't know if Took you can the L, see brother. this. I drew, What's up, brother? I drew a, Enjoy that I drew a playing. I drew a playing card of an ace of an ace with a big L in it. I don't know if you can see that. Your camera's booty. Your yeah. camera's no, cheeks. It, it's, it's, it's my <laughs> ring light. See, see how it's your ring light right is there with cheeks. the hearts. It's, it's, see, see how the hearts. You can't see it. It's because you love me, Web. Oh, no, it's because you're so nice. Uh, yeah, whatever. All right, let's go. Let's go. All right, so that brings us to the last part of the episode, which is going to be. The blind side. All right, gentlemen. Uh, question is, should the USFL cities like Memphis and Michigan be concerned about their team possibly leaving if the attendance doesn't improve by the end of the season? We've heard Moose say that he was disappointed in Memphis already for their opener which kicked off at 11 a.m. local time. And Michigan folks couldn't get single game tickets until a couple of weeks before the season started, even though their season started with three home games. Is, okay. there, any, is there anything you can do to, or say, to encourage fans in those markets? Or should they worry are most of these problems due to the merger having come together so quickly? I'm going to say it doesn't have to do with the merger. I really don't yeah. think it is. I think these numbers are similar to what we had last season. And I think, yeah, you should be very afraid that they're going to take your team away. The Tampa Bay Bandits didn't have a lot of viewership in the Tampa Bay and Florida area. What happened to them? They immediately took that team away and moved it to Memphis. So they've already shown that they're willing to move a team. and. Yeah, these numbers suck. Memphis, the numbers look bad. It didn't look good on TV. It looked better last year at game one in Memphis than it did uh, this year. So unless these numbers get at least like a decent amount better, you know, a 10% increase, just something to show life. Yeah, you might lose your team. What do you think, Webb? Um, I think they messed up in Memphis by the coaching change. I really do. I, I think you could have brought in someone that was a little bit more um, successful, I would say. Uh, a little bigger name. Maybe maybe someone that's connected to Memphis. Uh, Jeff Fisher, you know, Tennessee, that mm. kind of thing. Um, I, I, I don't think Flip... I think Flip was more New Orleans kind of thing. And um, I think they could have brought in a different name. You could have brought in Horton. Like, you could have brought in someone that was a big star for coaching. Um, I think Memphis has less to worry about than Michigan. I think Michigan being outside the footprint hurts them a little bit because they're the furthest north outside yeah. of DC, but they're, they're, they're the furthest north. And Fred Smith, if Fred Smith's still involved with FedEx, well, he, he's involved with FedEx, but with the league and bringing a, a team to Memphis, I think that could help Memphis and maybe they're giving a little extra time. Um, 
I don't know the attendance numbers for Orlando last year, but Orlando kind of would fit the uh, footprint if their numbers were better than Michigan. Like, why not move the Michigan down to Florida? Um, that j- that's just my opinion. Uh, yeah, I I don't th- I don't think teams are endangered because I think it's a bad look for the league to just keep moving teams, especially when you're trying to build it. You got to give them two years in this new format and. Hell, we didn't even know the schedule until January, right? Yeah, we, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't know that if it was going to start in April or if it was going to start in February. Like we, we didn't. We knew nothing. So, and then Michigan, like you, you tried to start. You started selling tickets in the middle of March, the single game tickets. You didn't even give them a real opportunity like the rest of the league. So I, I just, I'm excited to see Birmingham because Birmingham. Birmingham's number is really going to set the tone because in all reality, Birmingham is the last USFL team that could maybe put up a good number because Houston, as much as everyone says that they're a USFL team, they are by players and coaches, but that brand connected with the city before. So like Houston kind of is an XFL and right now the USFL side, and I know we're both USFL guys the last two years is really disappointing. It is. Memphis is extremely disappointing. I know they do the BOGO now, I don't know if you but saw that today. But wasn't There's, Cole Kelly supposed to be their like whole like connection to Memphis? Uh it was Brady. It, yeah, uh, it was Brady White. Oh, because yeah, Brady yeah, White yeah. was the most winning quarterback in the University of Memphis history, and then he wasn't good in the USFL. So they brought in Cole Kelly, and then he got waived before the season even started. So they didn't yeah. even have like the consistency there. They don't have barely any consistency in play with players from last year. They don't have the same coaches other than, you know, Carnell Lake. They have their um, their defensive coordinator, but people weren't really paying attention to that. Right. That's not the face of the team. And so, yeah, they're taking a hit. And also, uh, this was something that I was kind of worried about before the season, because when I went to the uh, season ticket holder event where Moose and CJ were talking, Moose was talking about people asked him, they said, hey, are we going to get, you know, some events in Houston where we get to hang out with the players and all this stuff? And he was like, we're still working on that and all that. So before the season, they weren't really doing a lot of events. They weren't really doing things to help get people who didn't know about spring football and the UFL to hear about the league. They weren't doing events in the markets. And that's tough because, yeah, the people who have been paying attention the whole time, they're going to know about it. The people who have been fans of the 2020 teams, like the XFL teams for this long, the Defenders, the Battle Hawks, they already knew about it. They were already biting at the uh, chomp or chomping at the bits. There you go. And I don't know. I just think they didn't do enough to get the branding and the name out there for the USFL side. I really don't think they did. Birmingham, it was built in because that was the hub. You know, they did so much in the city of Birmingham that the city does know about it. But then outside of that, Michigan, they've been there like six times total, <laughs> you know, like yeah. they, the cities don't know or care enough yet and they haven't done enough to make them care. So I think that we're seeing that and they need to learn from it. So, yes, I like what you said. They should at least give them two seasons because they need to learn from this and try to make it better next year. And if they can't do it and it does not progress, then I think you move a team. And then, yeah, you go yeah, to Orlando. Yeah. Go for it. Well, the the sad thing is Memphis doesn't have a professional football team. At least Detroit, you know, they got a winning team now. I, I know like three, no, but three years ago or two years ago when this whole thing started, right? Two seasons A ago, lot of Detroit fans were was, happy. Uh, the, yeah, because it's like, oh, we got a chance to actually win. Yeah, have a team. And now, now not having a, having a su- successful NFL team in that same exact stadium. They're not as hungry for like, another team. Yeah, yeah. And their football appetite and you know they just won the michigan national championship like michigan's good with football right now so yeah so the panthers i could kind of see that falling off but michigan or memphis has no excuse dude no excuse i i i agree i agree and the same thing with birmingham if birmingham um doesn't we'll show up this I'm, I'm, I'm hoping birmingham i'm hoping birmingham yeah. they gotta hit at least fourteen thousand. they have to do match san antonio on Oof. easter Oof. i know i know that's a big ass I, uh, dude that's a big no ask. but like like so, so what? What's a good number then? Ten. I think if they hit over ten, because the USFL teams, none of them have hit over ten. Yeah. If they can hit over ten, that at least shows that the USFL is viable to get six digits, five yeah. digits. 
five digits. And 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 it's uh, the other home teams are what this week? Uh, San Antonio, San Antonio, Arlington, and Michigan. Yeah, so B- Birmingham's got to be in the top two for attendance. Arlington obviously um, doesn't have really great attendance. I know they did the game you went to. They did week one. Didn't feel like it. I, Weird stadium. But it, it, it's also they were bringing Birmingham. You know, it's champion versus champion. It's only going to go down probably. Um, and they haven't San won Antonio, a game. <laughs> San, San Antonio might. San Antonio should be the leader this week in attendance. They so. easily should. They're two and zero. Oh. Nobody thought they would be. They yeah. had fourteen. What almost fourteen thousand week one on on Easter Sunday. On Easter Sunday, so they should be able to hit. Uh, I remember Dustin. What he like eyeballed it, and he thought that they were going to have about twenty one thousand week one. It did not hit that. Uh, Josh actually made a bet. With another uh, San Antonio Brahmas guy. He's one of the dudes. He's got a backwards hat on. He's in like a bunch of their promo stuff after last week because he was up in Memphis. I think he's on like the Horns Board podcast or something. They made a bet. The under over was 17,000 and Josh took the over. That other dude won a beer. Josh, I hope you get him that beer. But uh, I'm hoping that they can hit 17,000 this week because that would be really cool. That would be a substantial bump up. It's not Easter weekend. Your team is 2-0. and Like it's a good time. And it would be really cool if they hit 17. Yeah, and it would be interesting to watch TV numbers, too, because now they don't have... I know they got the Masters, but, but March Madness Masters and baseball, yeah. Yeah, March Madness isn't hitting the same. You got to remember, when D.C. and Houston were playing this past week, they were going against college Caitlin Clark, basketball. Dude. They yeah, were Caitlin going Clark, against yeah. the NCAA Women's <laughs> National Championship. Yeah, so And they still those got numbers decent numbers. Yeah, yeah. Those still numbers got decent fun. numbers. Well, it's Joe Clatt, man. Anytime Joe Clatt, oh, and I told I told Alex, I was like, Alex, you went to he went he was at the DC game, and I was like, man, you went to the worst one because Joe Clatt is probably not going to announce many DC games, and this is the one you're missing. And it's Joe Clatt on TV, and he's like, yeah, but I was with the beer snake, and I was like, that is cool, that is cool. Tip of the snake to you, lads. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, we have knocked it all out. We kept it under an hour. I think this was a successful episode. What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm going 4 it. 0. It's, I got a 4 0 mentality. 4 0 mentality? No. I think I'm going to take the lead this week. I'm, I'm manifesting it. What is, what is it that Utah women say? I'm manifesting success. There we go. That's what I'm doing this week. All right. Special teams, special players, special plays. Tuesday, Tuesday. All right. But we will see you next, next Friday. <laughs> so. Let's go. Say goodbye to the people, Web. All right. Bye, people. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for watching the UFM United Football Media. If you like that, please make sure to like and subscribe. Also, if you want more videos, you can check them out on our channel over here. The best one for you is right here. And then if you like mine, the rest of my playlist is right here. Thank you, guys, and I hope to see you next time.